Start basketball. Hey, hoop heads! Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason and marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market and truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Beyond efficient reps, Dr. Dish provides training expertise and versatility designed to develop complete players. The new Dr. Dish CT machine has further revolutionized basketball training with over 150 plus on-demand individual and team workouts from some of the best coaches and trainers in the game. These workouts include video instruction and combine game-like shooting drills with ball handling, conditioning, and agility drills. Along with workouts, the Dr. Dish training management system also provides stat tracking and analytics to track progress and ensure accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you mention the Hoop Heads podcast to get $300 off your next Dr. Dish purchase. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get out and get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Coach Dawkins is very unique. He's kind of like, and he learned this from Coach K, is, you know, if we win by one or lose by one or win by 30 and lose by however so much, we're going to come up to the office after the game and we're going to watch the game back over literally right after. So <laughs> we do that every game. So we'll break it down right after. All the emotions are still there. And, you know, we're up here in the in the film room, up in the conference room, trying to, you know, break down how we're going to, you know, get better the next day in practice. Jacob Ammerman is entering his fourth season as the video coordinator under head coach Johnny Dawkins and his sixth season overall at the University of Central Florida. Ammerman previously coached for one season at Flagler College, his alma mater, under head coach Bo Clark, where he also served as a team manager for the men's basketball program during his four years as a student at Flagler. Jacob grew up in Newcastle, Indiana, the heart of Indiana basketball. Newcastle is the hometown of Steve Alford and boasts the world's largest high school basketball gym. His dad was a high school coach and coached his AAU teams growing up there. Ammerman and his family moved to Tampa, Florida when he was 13 and enrolled at Oldsmar Christian, where he played for Ryan Pannone, who is now the head coach of the Erie Bayhawks in the G League. If you have a chance to leave us a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast app, we would really appreciate it. Tell your friends in the coaching community about the show, and make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. Check out hoopheadspod.com, where you can listen to every episode we've ever recorded, and find out more about what drives our show. Be prepared to listen and learn throughout this episode with Jacob Ammerman, the video coordinator at the University of Central Florida. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Suckle. And tonight we are pleased to welcome from the University of Central Florida, Jacob Ammerman. Jacob, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm, I'm so happy to be on here with you guys. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun to dive into your backstory, learn a little bit more about how you got into coaching and the great things that you're doing now at Central Florida and with your social media. But let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid and talk to us a little bit about how you got into the game, what made you fall in love with basketball when you were younger. Yeah, so I I grew up in a uh, small town in Indiana, uh, Newcastle, Indiana, which uh, for those that are from Indiana know that's, that's kind of the heart of basketball. And for those who don't know Newcastle, Indiana, it's about, 15 to 20 minutes where the movie Hoosiers was filmed. So it's very close to that. I kind of grew up in the old Hoosier gym where they where they play all the games in the movie. But uh, Newcastle has the world's largest high school gymnasium. And it's also the home of Steve Offord. So I, I kind of grew up in basketball heartland. Uh, my dad, growing up, my dad was a, a coach, a basketball coach, and uh, coached me and my brother. And he kind of he kind of he kind of made me love the game of basketball of how passionate he was in teaching us and 
you know, I remember when I was, you know, three, four years old, him teaching me how to shoot basketball um, at the youngest age, shooting for him. We had this little goal out back. Uh, that's that's kind of where my passion started. And then as I was growing up in Indiana, there was all kinds of great high school players that I, I witnessed play from uh, at Newcastle at the time. There was a kid named Brandon Miller who went on to play a Butler and uh, actually was the head coach of Butler for a little bit, coach under Brad Stevens. Uh, there was also a player named Darnell Archie, uh, who I believe is a D3 head coach now, but he's been on staffs at Butler and South Alabama and, and a couple places. But I grew up watching some really great high school basketball. And, and at that time, that's when the big Indiana Purdue rivalry was going on. So I grew up watching, you know, uh, Luke Recker, AJ Guyton uh, playing against Purdue, and, and Purdue was loaded too. And, uh, just grew up in that time frame, watching watching that kind of basketball, and being around it all the time, and, and playing AU travel ball. I just kind of, I just really fell in love with it. And from the youngest age, you know, seeing my dad as a coach, uh, that's kind of where my passion of coaching kind of really came from. Was was witnessing uh, how much time and effort he spent into uh, my brother and I uh, in coaching. And uh, he would he would drive us everywhere in the state just to just to play a basketball game. And, and that, that's kind of that's just kind of where I fell in love with it right there. What do you remember most about your time with your dad? What do you remember most about him as a coach? Just the way he went about coaching you and your brother. What do you remember about that? He, he was a lot harder on us than he was with the rest of the team. Uh, I, I, that's one thing I remember. And I just remember how committed he was. Like he would never, he would never let my brother and I miss a practice. Um, you know, he he was just really hard on us, and and he made sure that we got our shots in every day, <laughs> ball handling every day. Uh, I mean, he always he he would always pre his biggest thing was he would always tell me and my brother that you know somewhere right now somebody's excelling in this so. He's like, if you take time off, then they're going to just lap you. So you got to get out and put the work in. That, that was his biggest thing. And that's his like motto that he always went by. So uh, that's that's the biggest thing I remember of how passionate he was and to me and my brother, you know, becoming the best basketball players we could be. So at that time when he's pushing you and, and trying to get you to be obviously at your best, besides doing those workouts and practice with, your with your brother and your father where else were you going to be able to get some practice in were you playing some pickup basketball were you mostly working on your game with your brother and your dad or just kind of talk about your process for how you went about getting better as a player during that time when you were let's say in middle school high school age yeah so i think i think that that kind of came with uh you know i had a couple of buddies in middle school and elementary school and we we grew up just you know on the on this goal that my dad put in for it. He put in a really nice goal. Uh, I forget what the name of the goal was, but it was one of those ones that had the, the rim that you could hang on. And, and I had like six or seven friends that would bicycle over every day and we'd play basketball until it got dark. Uh, and this is back when, you know, kids actually played outside. If right, you know exactly. <laughs> we know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I fell in love with like we would do dunk contests, man. We would just get out there and have shooting contests, and that's and that's when I really, really put the time in is because I would compete with them guys. Um, we would just compete. We would have shooting contests, and that's kind of where I learned how to love winning and stuff. Uh, we we would go three on three, two on two dunk contests, whatever we had to do, but we were competing in some type of some some type of basketball activity almost daily. And uh, my house kind of turned into that house everybody kind of hung out at. And, you know, we, we played basketball until midnight, 1, 1 a.m. almost almost every day. So um, I, th I think that's, that's kind of where, you know, I, I started becoming a, a pretty good player and, and shooting all the shots. I mean, I was probably shooting 500 to 1,000 shots a day. I was just messing around in my, in our, in my driveway, so – so when you were a kid at that age, let's say prior to high school, so think in elementary, middle school, uh, were you going to a lot of high school games where you were watching guys and saying, man, I can't wait to be like these guys that I'm that I'm watching. They're my role models. Was that something that 
you felt growing up when you would go to games? No question. I I got to see some unbelievable high school basketball growing up. Uh, I remember going to watch, you know, Gray Godin, Mike Conley. Um, when I was really little, I went and saw Jason Gardner play, who ended up going to Arizona and playing, and he had about 50 points. And, you know, I made my dad after that game, I think I was like probably eight or nine years old. After that game, I, I made my dad drive me to the gym. <laughs> we got back home because I was so like, I was so wowed by it. Uh, even, even the high school women's basketball, we went and saw, we would go see a girl, uh, by the name of Katie Gerald's that played and she's one of the best women's basketball players I'd ever seen. And he would take me to see the women's games too. And I mean, she, she had a game I went to that where she had like 60. I mean, it was unbelievable <laughs> out there. Just, I mean, just, just the competitiveness of, of the high school players. I mean, I could go. There's a long line of uh, kids that I saw, but, you know, watching Brandon Miller and Darnell Archie is kind of – that's the kind of basketball that I really love because they had a sense of toughness, and that's that's why they were on a, the team that took Butler to, I want to say, their first Sweet 16. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's kind of – I mean, just, just the level of play in the crowds. The crowds are unbelievable. Uh, where I grew up – at Newcastle, it seats about I want to say ten thousand people, and it's and they they host the sectionals there, and it, it gets probably ninety five percent full, and it's like playing in front of a, a college crowd almost. So it it was just a another level of of high school basketball. Yeah, for sure. We talked to Jason Zimmerman from Emory, and he talked about growing up in Warsaw and the fact that yeah. people were so into the team as a high school team that you know his crowds when he were in high was it when he was in high school were bigger than when he first got to davidson you know he goes here i am here i am playing division one basketball and the crowds are smaller there's less people that are you know that are invested in it at least at that again at that time davidson basketball yeah. at that time wasn't what it is now That's humble. but he was just saying that you know the people would ask him hey did you feel pressure when you got to college he's like no not really because when i was 15 i had you know, 70 year old men walking up to me in the street saying, Hey, how could you miss that shot last night? You know, on <laughs> Friday night in the game. So it sounds like your environment was pretty similar to that. Oh, it's, it's like, it's one, it's like something you see in a movie where, you know, the barber shops close, everybody's at the game kind of thing. Like everything closes down to come to the, the game on a Friday night. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's just like that. And Warsaw has got one of the biggest gyms too. I mean, their gym, their gym's huge, but it's just like that. It's like, like watching Hoosiers, how everything shuts down. It's, it's just another, it's just another level of basketball. You you can't get it anywhere else. Indiana basketball is, I mean, it's it's incredible. Yeah, when you have that kind of support for high school basketball, I think there's there's nothing better as a player when you get to play in that environment. Where you're playing in front of big crowds, especially when you think about it, a high school player. You know, if you're a sophomore, or a junior, you're 15, 16 years old getting an opportunity to play in front of six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand people. I mean, that's gotta be a huge, huge thrill. What do you remember? Can you think of, pick out, you know, one or two or maybe of your favorite memories that you'd share with us from from your time playing high school basketball? Yeah. Uh one uh I think one of the biggest is I wanted the district championship. Um my junior junior year of high school and it was kind of a very special moment just because nobody nobody picked us to do anything and we and we stole a game it was the end of the third quarter and a teammate of mine hit a half court shot and the other team just kind of gave up and uh the crowd went nuts and from ever since then that fourth quarter I mean I'm not sure the team we were playing scored five points in that fourth quarter we we just won it from there I think that's one of my biggest memories was just the time that we celebrated after that game um probably the other biggest memory is and this is this is crazy because i i wouldn't even play and i was an eighth grader but i was on high school team we had moved to florida uh i was playing oldsmark christian and i was just on the roster and my brother was actually on the team and we were playing in the regionals and um my brother hit such a big shot, man, and I was it was it was so big and it actually helped us go to the regional championship. 
and that moment of high school basketball for me, seeing my brother from all the years of practice and, and him hitting that shot and just the crowd erupting, sending, sending, it to, sending us to the regional championship, I think that was – that's probably my favorite memory uh, of anything. So um, I think those two for sure are definitely my top two. That's very cool with your brother. So I'm assuming that you and your brother – beat up on each other a lot as you were coming up but yeah obviously <laughs> since that's your favorite memory you still had some you still had some positive feelings for him despite the fact that i'm sure you guys were beating each other up and competing all through your childhood oh no question i i definitely pestered him and uh luckily he didn't beat me up too much yeah i mean he's he's four years older than i am so he kind of i mean he kind of kept it easy on me a little bit and your high school coach down there in florida has uh <clears throat> moved on to bigger and better things, become kind of a well-known name. So why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about what that experience was like uh, playing for him? Yeah, so uh, I was what, 14 or 15, and, I, and we moved down here to Oldsmar Christian. And I remember walking in the gym, and the coach is a young guy uh, by the name of Ryan Pannone. And he was probably, man, he could have been 21 or 22, I would think. And I remember just being so impressed by how much he knew of the game and how passionate he was. And I, I knew at the time he was going to be a heck of a coach. And I play, I played for him for a couple of years. And just his attention to detail um, offensively and holding kids accountable, uh, I mean, he was really good. And uh, from there, I developed a great relationship with Coach Pannone. Um he was a heck of a coach to me. And then from there, I mean, he went on to uh, coach overseas. I mean, he coached in Jerusalem. Uh, he coached Amari Stoudemire last year, which is pretty incredible as an assistant. And uh, this summer he got the chance, um, the Pelicans affiliate, the uh, Erie Bayhawks hired him as the head coach. And I actually got to spend a lot of time with Coach Pannone this summer uh, out, in, out in Vegas. Um, he actually, <laughs> he let me stay stay with him out in Vegas. He's, he's a, he's, he's a heck of a coach, man. An even better person. He taught me a lot of core values out and he's the type of guy you can call any, any time of the day or night, he's going to answer and he's going to talk basketball with you. So I, I had such an in, in, incredible experience with him. And you, like I said, you could tell at 21 or 22, he was going to be a big time coach. I mean, he was just, he was one of those guys that number one, he studied the game. Number two, he's a heck of a heck of a communicator, and number three, he he actually he really loves his players, and he's going to invest all his time in the in them. So, uh, like I said, you just tell he's going to be successful uh, from a young age. So, if you think of your time with him, you mentioned a couple of things there, but can you give us maybe one or two specific things that you took from him that you still use today, as far as your own coaching something that or maybe something you filed away for if you ever get a chance to you know run your own program or be a head coach is there anything that you can point to from coach Pannone that you that you quote stole from him and that you kind of have in your back pocket that helps to make you a better coach yeah I mean he's taught me a lot of things and from different stages of of my career so far so I think the most recent thing you know when I was a GA um he told me to go out and invest in a, in a hard drive. And I think that that actually really helped me. Um, so he wanted me to invest in a hard drive because I was around some great coaches and he said, man, you need to store everything on that. Anything you come in contact with, uh, whether it's a document or a video or a play of any sort, he's like, you need to keep all that stuff. And I went out and did that. And it's actually, I mean, it helped me to this day. Um, you know, it's helped me, come to the table with different ideals just because I had some stuff stored from previous coaches or, you know, maybe I had a video of a play that I thought we should run and I could find it on there. But I thought that was, that was really good. That helped me out a lot. And then as a coach, I mean, he, he really taught me how to hold kids accountable. I mean, he was, he was really good at that. Um, if we came in with, you know, poor effort, I mean, we were getting put on the line. We were running <laughs> teams. Um, I mean, he was, he, he just showed me that there's a way to be really tough on kids, but 
you know, you can still have a great relationship with him. I think that was one of the biggest things he kind of showed me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, he was, he's such a good coach, man. I'm like I said, I'm not surprised where he's at right now. I think, I think one day he'll be coaching a uh, level up. So I think, I think he's that good. So how did he build, how did he build a relationship maybe specifically with you and okay. then maybe more in general with, you know, your teammates and other guys mm-hmm. that he was coaching that then in turn allows him to coach the guys hard and hold them accountable. Cause I think those two things mm-hmm. really go hand in hand when you can build the relationship first and then your guys know where you're coming from when you're a coach and you're pushing them. They kind of mm-hmm. understand that, Hey, coach cares about me. He wants me to be at my best. And yeah, what he's asking me to do is tough or he's holding me to a higher standard than maybe I might hold myself. But that relationship is what you fall back on. So how do you build that relationship with you and with your teammates? I think I think the biggest thing with him that I I really remember was just he was always around, and he was he was working like every every second was around. Like I just remember getting out of school and he was there and he would stay. I mean, he would stay. We would go through conditioning. He would stay with practice. I mean, he didn't really have a life outside of coaching us. I mean, right. he was always there, and he wasn't. I mean, it wasn't just straight basketball with him. It was, and I think that's what led him to be able to hold us accountable. The relationship was there because we had a relationship. It wasn't just basketball. I mean, we would talk about other sports. Uh, I remember, yeah, I mean, Ryan's a, he's, he's, he's kind of comedian. He's a funny dude. So he's always joking around messing with us. And, um, I think, I think those, those were key. It, It wasn't just basketball. It was, it was life. It was sports and, you know, it was cracking jokes. Um, and then obviously from, you know, witness, witnessing him, you could just see, like I said, how hard he worked. I mean, I mean, from, from like putting in plays, the study in the game. I mean, he was always bringing something new to the table. Um, his drills, his drills were ahead of their time, really. Like I see, uh, I mean, I remember him doing a couple of drills then that, you know, that I had never seen before. And now we're still doing them today. Like he, he's an unbelievable teacher. I think, I think that's the biggest thing for him. He's, he's really good at teaching the game. What do you think makes somebody just a general question? What do you think makes somebody good at teaching the game? When you look at a coach and you walk into a gym and you're watching their practice or you're thinking about for yourself, trying to become a better teacher of the game, what do you think makes a good teacher of the game what is it about a particular coach that makes them makes them a good teacher i say i think uh you know i i think you got to be a really good communicator i think that's key and and you got to know who you're you're teaching to a lot of a lot of kids learn differently um obviously some, some kids are better visual learners some some kids are better where you you know physically show them or some kids can just hear it and do it uh, I think you got to know your audience. Uh, you got to be able to communi- communicate it clearly, uh, and you got to have a good knowledge of what you're doing. I mean, you got to the kid. The players are going to know if if you're just kind of BSing them. So you you got to you got to have a good grasp and put the work in early and, and kind of know what you're talking about. But I I think those are some key things, but the real thing is, is the players got to respect you and believe that what you're telling them is, is, is what's going to help them to become better. Um, if, if they just think that you're, you know, you're doing it for the wrong reasons, then they're not going to buy into it. So I, th- I think communi- communicating, knowing your audience, uh, having a great knowledge. And I think the relationship uh, is, is kind of what sums up being a good teacher. I, I think all those things are key values that, that they need to be able to trust that what you're saying is for their best benefit and not just for your benefit kind of thing. So they got to buy into it. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you anymore. I think what I heard you say is one, you've got to put the time in to understand a understand the game. So you know what you're teaching mm-hmm. B you have to put in the time, not just, studying the game and studying those X's and O's and studying techniques and fundamentals, but you also have to put the time in with the players and that's building relationships 
not just on the basketball floor, but as you said, talking about life and asking them about what's going on off the floor. And so those are two elements of time. And then the next thing you mentioned was credibility. And I think credibility comes from what we just described there, which is that I put the time in to know what it is that I'm trying to teach. So do I understand the game? Do I understand the fundamentals? Do I understand how it's going to impact my players? And then I also have credibility when the players know that I've put time into them, not just as a basketball player, but as a person. So you combine all those things, and now you put in the time. That gives you the credibility. And then the last piece that you mentioned was the ability then to communicate. So if you have the first two pieces, you still have to have that last piece where, yeah, I might have the time, I might have the, you know, put the time in, I might have the credibility, but I have to also be able to communicate clearly to my players what the expectation is for what they need to do. And I think sometimes if you have, if one of those pieces is missing, it can definitely impact your ability to, you know, to be a great teacher of the game, which, you know, somebody who is a great teacher is going to have all three of those elements. No question. Yeah. I, I think, I think what you said, I, I think, I think the biggest key, like kind of what you're hitting at, I think the relationship's so key. Like, you can you can have the most knowledge in the world and you can be able to you know speak so clearly but if the relationship's not there and the kid's not in the, the right state of mind they're not going to listen to you especially if they don't respect you so you got to do your work early and build that foundation of trust uh, and that starts with you know spending time with them outside of basketball or you know having them come in the office and just talking about life i mean it, it just can't be all x's and o's uh, or, it's going to be tough to tough to have the kids full attention really i mean obviously it depends on the kid but i mean in the kids that i work with and the kids that are on our team it's it, it can't just be basketball it's got to be you know you got to take you got to take into account everything that's that's going on uh in their lives from family to academics to their stories and and all that other stuff i mean th those things are so key in the, in the teaching a kid and, and helping them become better so how do you – let's jump ahead before we jump backwards, but let's just go to your current role since you mentioned it there. So at University of Central Florida, what are you doing on a daily basis to help – how do you get the time – how do you find the time to build those relationships with kids? What, are, what exactly are you doing day to day? Obviously, Johnny Dawkins is the head coach, and he's got his ways and things that he can do to build relationships to mm -hmm. probably get into. But for you and your role on the staff – how do you go about building those relationships with the players? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing uh, with with my job as, as the video guy is, you know, making sure that the players know that my office is always open if they want to come in and talk. Or, you know, I, I'm the youngest guy on staff, so I think it's always good, you know, to be that young guy because, you know, I can relate. I kind of know more kind of what a what a younger athlete of, of their age is kind of going on this you know their generation what's going on right now kind of what's what's going like happening what's in kind of thing so you know I'll, I'll have the guys they'll come by I'll ask them about you know we got guys that love watching tv shows like Netflix shows so we'll talk about that or Game of Thrones you know we'll, we'll talk about other stuff other than basketball so um we, we, you know, I try to pick on things I have in common with guys, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stretch their minds a little bit. I'll, you know, I'll test them about academics and, you know, I'll quiz them on stuff. And, you know, I, when a kid comes into the office, I, you know, I try not to just be all basketball, but, uh, other ways I do that, you know, we just took a trip to Spain. Uh, so it was a good foreign tour and I got a chance to, you know, eat dinner with a couple of them, uh, take them out to dinner, you know, take them to lunch. Uh, we went to Madrid, Barcelona and Valencia and I, I got to spend some quality times with time with them outside of just playing. So uh, I got to develop some great relationships just from that. But, you know, outside of outside of just doing events or going places, you know, uh, maybe a, occasionally have a guy over for dinner. Um, you know, I'm, I'm married. So me and my wife, you know, we can, we have a player over for dinner, you know, sh she can make dinner, you know, th there's all kinds of ways that I do it. Um, but the main thing is, you know, when, when they come in the office, you know, just taking that time and really, 
you know, focusing on just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them really. And, uh, they love it. I mean, you know, I, tr I try to be the one that always asks questions and to them. So they, you know, I kind of understand what's going on in their lives. Yeah. It's such a huge and important piece of conversation. We all know that we've met people who just talk about themselves and you can have, yeah. a, you can have a, we've, we've all been at that dinner party or out somewhere where you meet somebody and you talk to them for a half hour and you might ask them 20 questions and they talk the whole time and never ask you one <laughs> thing about themselves. And yeah. after you get done with that conversation, you know that you're never going back. <laughs> you're never, Coach, you know. Coach Dawkins says a great saying about that, that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Absolutely. So. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, it's funny because we all can, I'm sure just anybody who's listening I'm sure as we're saying that there's there's a memory that pops into people's heads of oh yeah I remember that first time I met that person who you know who they have in mind that is that way and so I think to your point when especially with you know you're talking about coaching whether it's college athletes or you're talking about coaching high school, high school athletes or middle school athletes when you take the time to listen to somebody and ask them questions to give them a chance to talk about themselves I mean we all love to talk about ourselves I mean let's face it uh, there's no question that we like to be able to share the things that are important to us and, and share our story. But by the same token, I think that the best communicators often are the people who are the best listeners because they're able to ask questions that really probe deep into somebody uh, and help them to be able to understand how much you care about them. And that, as you've said multiple times already, that that relationship that you build with players is really what allows you to get the most out of them not only as a basketball player, but hopefully have an impact on their life, you know, far beyond whatever they get from you as a, as a basketball coach, they're going to get that from you. And that's going to improve the quality of their life five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. As you've listened to the Hoop Heads podcast, one common topic that continually comes up in our conversations is character. I'm fortunate to be associated with the Positive Coaching Alliance, a national nonprofit movement that provides valuable tools, training, and resources for coaches, athletes, parents, and administrators that is centered around sports and educational psychology and organizational behavior research. PCA combines this research with practical advice from a national advisory board of top pro and college athletes and coaches who utilize PCA principles at the highest levels of competition. Through a partnership with our local Cleveland chapter of the PCA, we are pleased to offer a discount code to allow you, our listeners, to take a PCA online course for just $20. To take advantage of this offer, visit the store on positivecoach.org and enter the discount code HOOPHEADS20. That's HOOPHEADS20 with two capital H's. Coaches, I hope you'll take advantage of this great offer from the Positive Coaching Alliance and help us continue to grow the game. Let's think back. When did you realize that you wanted to be a coach? Was it something that you always knew because your dad was a high school coach and he had spent so much time coaching you? Did you kind of always think, hey, whenever I'm done playing the game, I'm going to be a coach? Or was it something that during your playing career you were kind of so focused on playing that it never hit you until after you were done? Or when did you really come to the realization that, hey, I think I might want to get into coaching? Uh, I, th I think I knew from a, a young age. I mean, I, I knew I wanted to be like my dad. I knew I wanted to coach. I just wasn't sure at the time what level I wanted to be at. Um, but, you know, I, I figured that out, you know, you know, in my playing career. I figured out that, you know, I wanted to be on the college level. Um, I've never really had an itch on, for the NBA level. Um, but I, I love the college level because of the, the change. I, I love, you know, you get to work with young kids coming out of high school and every, you know, four years or if you got a kid that's going the draft, you know, every so many, so many amount of years, uh, you know, you get a new kid in and it's just the constant recruiting changes. And, you know, my biggest thing, too, is I love, you know, that they're getting getting a uh, degree. I, I like that part of it. I think academics was another big key uh, into why I wanted to coach college. But uh, yeah, I, th I think just watching my dad, um, the passion he put into it and how much he loved what he did just kind of rubbed off on me. Um, I think the, that and the love of the game, um, 
And then just the coaches that I had just really, I never really had a bad experience with a coach. I mean, all the coaches that I had just made me want to coach. And I think that's, that's a huge thing. Um, you know, a lot of times you hear kids growing up and they have a bad experience with a coach or whatsoever. I, I just never have had that. I've, I've learned something from every coach that I've had. So it just kind of made me, you know, want to get in that profession, you know, of, of what I've learned from the coaches that I I've had. Um, and that's kind of just what made me uh, want to become a coach. And, you know, college has always just been so intriguing to me. Um, you know, I, I worked a lot of uh, camps, you know, when I was in school, uh, were Indiana's camp, which was, which was awesome. I got to Tom Crean was, was coaching at IU and I went and worked their camp and, you know, you just learn so much by other people's programs. And I, 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 I just, I've always had an interest in, in that and how, you know, cultures are different, um, how winning cultures, uh, conduct themselves and what they do. And I just, I just love that about college basketball. I, and that's that's just why my passion is so so big into what I'm doing is just you know the fact that you can you can take a 17 18 year old kid and you're in one of the parts of their life that's so important and you know you can you can show them you know you can build them from where they're at and by the time they graduate they're a man and and that's that's kind of what I just went through I was with BJ Taylor and Taco for I was with Taco for four years and BJ for five years. Uh, since they, I was, I was actually here for Taco's visit. You know, I, I helped drive him on the golf cart, and I, I saw him come in as a kid that was super quiet, uh, didn't really say much on his visit, and I saw him become an actual man. I mean, <laughs> yeah. he's a confident dude now, and you just see those changes in their life. And to be honest, man, that's that's the exact reason. And and this is the first year since I've been at UCF, I won't have BJ who's been, been here the whole time that I was, that I was here. So I'm, I'm just now starting to see that first change uh, of a group of kids that, you know, I won't have anymore. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's just, I love that, that it's ever changing. There's always something new every season that's its own, uh, its own pretty much, you know, life. I mean, you had, you start, you know, in the summer, you know, you're born and by the end of the year, you know, you you kind of you die pretty much every every year of your life because it's yep. never gonna be the same team. There's going to be somebody that graduates. There's going to be somebody that transfers. There's going to be new kids coming in. So every year, uh, it's its own identity, and that's something I I really like. Yeah, I would think that that would be something that would be very very appealing. In that you always have to sort of figure out, okay, how do we put this? How do we put these puzzle pieces together? And you know, yeah, you may have your overarching philosophy as a program and as a coach, but ultimately the best coaches are able to, within the framework of their culture, they're able to create a situation that puts their team and their players in the best possible situation to succeed. I want to ask you a question about something that you said there, which I always find to be pretty interesting, which is the fact that there's all different ways to develop. You know, we talk about winning cultures. And there's so many different coaches out there that don't do it the exact same way. But yet, if you describe what they're doing, you would say that's a winning culture. And they may not have the same way of going about getting to that, but they ultimately end up at the same place, which is success. However you want to define that, whether that's one loss record, whether that's graduation rates, whether that's the success of their players after they get out of school. All those things obviously contribute to a winning culture. So how much did you or do you get a chance to go and watch other teams practice, whether that's just going and checking out a high school when you may be helping with recruiting, when you're maybe you, you go and you're able to check out another team's practice, or you're in the summer, you mentioned about summer camps. So just talk a little bit maybe about the opportunity to go and observe different coaches and then what you take from them when you go and watch them. Yeah, I, I I think the biggest thing for me, and I mentioned one thing was, was this summer I went to summer league out in Vegas and I went to coaching you live and did the coaching clinics and just being around other coaches. I think as a young coach, you know, you got to find ways to just stay getting better. Uh, 
whether that's learning from the coaches you're with. Uh, the, the big thing with me is, you know, a lot of times, you know, you can't go to different practices. You're so you're so into what you're doing, uh, you know, with the group that you have. So the way I find time to get better in my craft is I watch a lot of YouTube clinics. Um, you know, I'll search John Wooden and watch a 30 minute speech from John Wooden or I'll, I'll watch a clinic from Eric Spolstra or, you know, I'll, I'll find different ways. You know, <laughs> we live, we live in uh, today's society where there's so much video out there. You can pretty much watch, you know, I watched a motivational speech from Tom Landry from the, I think it was from the seventies, a couple of days. Uh, that's ago, awesome. 45 minutes. But you can find ways to get better and it, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be just going to the gym, but you know, I, I like doing that. Um, you know, you, you see some great drills and you see the culture and how the players respect their coaches. I think, I think that's always stuff that you do see, but, um, I mean, for, for guys out there that are managers and GAs that maybe they just don't have a connection in the door to watch a practice, I mean, it's so easy just on YouTube to type something in and, and sit there and get better. I think I think that's the biggest thing for me that I do. Um, I watch a ton of YouTube. Like, this is going to sound crazy. I probably watch two hours of YouTube a day. So uh, I watch I'm, two hours of YouTube every day, too, but it's not basketball <laughs> drills. Of course, Jason's not quite as motivated as you are, Jacob. <laughs> that's a, I, I, some people would call me weird of how much YouTube I watch. <laughs> but, I, you know, I just have a passion for it. You know, I'll, what I'll do is, you know, if I'm working out or something, I'll have YouTube just playing in my headphones or somebody talking. Or if I'm in the car, I'll have something playing. Um, you know, I, I just try to find more ways to utilize my time and in, in listening to other people talk. Uh, I think that's key. And as far as, you know, going to places, you know, I, I love going to practices. It's just, you know, it, it's just so hard, you know, finding the time right. you know, on a college staff or sure. doing those things. Yeah. Uh, but you still got to find a way to do it. And that's, that's why YouTube's so, so vital for me getting better. And, and the other thing is asking the coaches that you work with questions or, or just getting other coaches on the phone. I think that's, that's so valuable. I, I do a lot of that. I'll, I'll try to call a coach and, you know, just pick their brain, you know, really. And uh, like we were talking about earlier, you know, just listening the whole time, asking questions and listening and just and just kind of observe and 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 use all that as ammunition to get better. Yeah, people are so willing. And I think coaching to some degree has always been like this. And I think it was probably less back in the other in, in bygone eras where everything wasn't an open book but nowadays because i think even if you wanted to keep something secret today about what you're doing whether it's culture x's and o's whatever everything is so filmed and so recorded and so out there that even if you wanted to keep something a secret as a coach it's almost impossible and so what we found is that everybody is so willing to share they're like i sure i'll give you my whole offense sure i'll yeah. tell you exactly what we're doing here because it's not like you can't find out that you know somebody like you that's watching two hours of youtube you could see and find just about anything you could possibly ever want to find about any coach any team any program and so what i found is that coaches are just super willing to be able to to be able to share i mean they you, you call them up you, you send them an email and they're sure i'll send you 10 drills or I'll talk to you about my culture or, you know, this podcast is just a, a tremendous example of that. If you would have told me when we started this back in June of 2018, I guess that, you know, suddenly we'd be up to close to 200 episodes and we'd be talking to all the different coaches that we've had and all the different levels and that they'd be so willing and open just to talk about their story and share the things that they do that help to make them successful. And you know, I would have, I don't know if I'd have believed you. And, and now after having done it for, you know, a year and a half. It's just, it's incredible what the coaching profession has become and that people are so, so willing to share. And I'm sure you find that in any time you reach out to someone. Yeah, no question. I, I see it. I see it every day with Coach Dawkins. Um, Coach Dawkins is so eager to give back. Uh, I mean, he's, he played in the NBA for 10 plus years and, you know, he always, he always, you know, 
if a manager has a question or somebody has a question, he always answers it. I mean, I, I see him do it every day. You know, somebody call him and ask for a drill, and he'll have me send it to him. Um, I see it from him, and, I, you know, I sit there and think sometimes, man, that guy, you know, he's the busiest guy I know. He's the hardest worker I know, and he still finds time to, you know, treat people right and, and do right by them. And, you know, I, I've asked him before, and he just says, you know, once you get to the level where he's at and everything he's done, I mean – he always says how blessed he is, but he said, man, you got to just, you got to give back. You know, the game's given me so much is what he says, and you just got to find a way to give back. So uh, I see him do it, and, you know, every, a lot of coaches do it, man. Uh, I mean, really, you know, like Coach Dawkins says, you, you, know, you got to give back. Not many coaches are going to hide, you know. You know, they, everybody in this profession is – is continuous learners really they're always trying to pick new new ways to get better and learn so uh it's crazy you know when i was when i was searching for a job you know i was trying to get better and everything and i, I was kind of defeated thinking man I, I don't know who to ask i don't know how to get in the college of basketball and i started reaching out to people and just sending emails or sending handwritten letters and what i found was there was head coaches that wrote me back with advice. <laughs> I mean, people want to help you. Um, you know, every, everybody has has their journey of how they started. And, you know, if, if you just take the time to, you know, write letters or, or do send emails or do stuff like that, or maybe just show up and, you know, ask a question, people are going to try to help you. I mean, if they see you're committed and you really want to do something, you know, they're, they're going to try to help you. Yeah, for sure. It goes back to what you talked about with players. If somebody sees you putting in the time, mm -hmm. which, again, could be as simple as writing an email, could be as simple as writing that handwritten thank you note when you get an opportunity to talk to someone, could just be reaching out to somebody who maybe doesn't have people reach out to them very much. You know, you think mm -hmm. about a high school coach, and there may not be a ton of people reaching out to them, but if you see something interesting or that coach inspires you in some way and you reach out to them, People are going to be willing to be able to share, and I think that's – it's just a great thing about the coaching profession. It's a great way, as you said, to learn. You want to be able to take – and not necessarily always have to reinvent the wheel, but just go out and look at the people who have had success before mm -hmm. you, see what they're doing, study what they're doing, and then take the things that you feel best apply to your program, your situation, your coaching style, because obviously you can't – copy everything that every successful coach does because all of our personalities are different so you got to be able to coach to who you are because as mm -hmm. you said earlier you know players sniff that out when you're not being genuine and when you're not credible mm -hmm. so when you find things that you can take and steal and like your hard drive story when you start putting stuff away that then you can incorporate into what you become mm -hmm. as a coach i think that's the key to being to being successful when you yeah, think nope. of, go ahead okay. No, I was just gonna. I was gonna piggyback off that. You gotta. You gotta have your own identity for sure. I mean, you can't just. You gotta have your own plan of your own culture. And you know, I'm not a. I'm not a head coach, but I'm thinking about when I am a head coach, what I'm gonna be able to do and what I'm gonna take from the stuff that I've liked or stuff I don't like. You got. You gotta have that mindset always of how are you creating your culture that you want to establish someday. I mean. I always think about that of how what identity I want, how I want my team to play, like all that stuff comes to my mind. And uh that's why the hard drive stories that I told you so key is I can store that stuff and you know, if say I think of something, I I have this, you know, file that I write little notes in, you know, stuff that I would want to implement. And I think that's key for a young coach that's really serious about one day being a head coach. Um you know, to store all that stuff away so you can go back and read it and take notes on stuff you like and maybe stuff you don't like. And then, you know, someday that's just when you get that head coaching job, you can sit back and read it. And, you know, that'll help you, you know, kind of build your culture a little faster. So your file is all electronic. Everything's electronic. I have it. I have it on a hard drive and I have it saved in Dropbox just in case my hard drive st stops working. Understood. So. So let's yeah. say you're so let's say you're out. So you're so you're out somewhere and you want to make sure, hey, I, I gotta make sure I remember this. Are you just putting that in through your phone? How are you what's your what's your method for somebody oh who's God. out there so, who's try, somebody who's trying to figure yeah. out, all right, how do I how do I take notes? How what kind of system do I set up? Tell us what your system is 
So maybe somebody who's just getting started in the business and wants to start compiling that list of notes and those things that they want to make sure they do. Just explain your system for us. So, yeah, so <laughs> the iPhone so great. So, <laughs> I just so I just opened up my iPhone. I have 1687 notes saved. <laughs> so I'm a very I'm a I take a lot of notes in my phone. <laughs> so from stuff that I hear on the the motivational talks I talk about on YouTube or you know little ideals that I have, I save everything. Uh, and I learned that I learned that from Coach Dawkins. He does that same thing. He'll he'll prepare for our meetings, uh, our film sessions. He'll write his notes in his phone, and I, I kind of learned that from him. Um, I have a I mean there's there's so much, so much notes in these <laughs> I'm kind of flipping through them right now, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's just an easy way. You know, you know how, you know, you get a, you're at the gym and you think of something really good and you're like, man, I got to write that down. So it's just an easy way. Just open up your notes, write it down. You know, maybe you don't look at it ever again. Maybe you do. Maybe you go back and read it, but at least you have a, you know, some data to, to kind of, jog your memory of it so do you pull it then off your phone into into the hard drive or does it kind of stay on the phone until you go back and relook at it a second time and say hey that's something i want to keep yeah so if it's a coaching i do i'll, I'll re-enter it on the on the word document for sure um a, a lot of times it's motivational stuff that i kind of use um you know for my twitter or um just stuff that i want to keep or you know it's usually it's usually the motivational stuff, but I have a coaching idea. I'll write it in there, and I'll I'll go back and and put it on the word document for sure. Gotcha, understood. All right, let's move backwards in time for just a second because I want to ask you this question. I think it's always an interesting one. If you think back to when you transitioned from your playing career to your coaching career, so your first quote real coaching position was at Flagler, where you had gone to school, correct? Yes. Yep. All right. So you transition from player to coach. What's that experience like? What was maybe different than what you expected when it came to being a coach at the college level? Was there anything that maybe was surprising to you that you hadn't realized that coaches either did or maybe you didn't realize they spent as much time doing something that you, you didn't realize that when you before you got into before you got into coaching? Yeah, I think I think the toughest part for me uh, when I first got that job was, you know, I was probably, I think I was 22, 21, 22. I think it was hard for me uh, understanding how hard it is to hold kids accountable when you're only that age as a right. coach. I had to learn to be uncomfortable um, in that sort of way. Um, the other thing is, is money. Uh, as a D2 assistant, you know, as a second assistant, you don't make a lot of money. So I had to learn that, you know, coming out of college, you know, you don't really know much about money. You have parents that help you or, you know, you right. have a job. So I, I learned what making money, uh, not much money, uh, how you really got a budget and do that kind of stuff. So uh, I think those are two big things. The, the holding kids accountable was tough. Uh, I kind of knew about how much you work, the hours that are spent. Uh, but what I didn't realize, especially on the D2 level, is uh, you're doing everything. Um, you know, at a, at a D1 level, you have video and ops and all that stuff, the support staff that does kind of all the little things. At the D2 level, the assistants are doing all that stuff. Um, so you're dealing with academics, you're dealing with the budget video um travel you're doing all that stuff so it, it was kind of you know it was very beneficial for me that that was my first my first route because i i got to learn all that stuff and if if you if you get the chance to ever do that or work and i'm sure juco is the same way uh you kind of you kind of get a grasp on everything because you kind of got to do everything so I learned how to video. I learned how to t cut tape. I learned how to do the budget, the travel. You know, I was taking, I was taking the kids to study hall. You know, you were kind of, <laughs> kind of doing a little bit of everything. So, uh, I think that was the biggest thing is is learning everything that first year that I was at Flagler, and just kind of learning how to hold the kids accountable and kind of getting out of my comfort zone a little bit. 
Um, and, and the tough part, the tough part, which, uh, you learn too is, is the travel, uh, that travel because you travel everything on a bus, whereas, you know, on a D one level, you're flying everywhere. So, uh, it, it was really cool. I, I kind of liked it to be honest, the bus travel, cause you got to really develop a relationship with your players cause you, you're spending a lot of time on a bus. So, right. yep. uh, yeah. So, uh, I was lucky enough. Uh, the coach Bo Clark had been there for like 20, 28, 29 years. So I learned a lot from him and, uh, I, I learned, I learned a lot about like a, the culture of how, of how to, how to establish things. And that, that first, you know, to be honest, that, that is one of my favorite years of coaching. And I'm sure a lot of people say that their first year, but it was a lot of fun. And we, we, we didn't even have a great record that year, but, I mean, it was just fun. The kids, the kids were awesome. I mean, it it was it was just a lot of fun. It it really made me want to just pursue coaching because I had such a great experience that first year. So, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I think you summed it up really, really well. You know, there's two points that you made. The last one right there that you know it was fun. And if you're going to be doing something, <laughs> you want it to be. You certainly want it to be. You certainly want it to be fun. And then the second piece is that you know you talked about how you kind of had to be a jack of all trades and get your hands into every aspect of the program and for somebody who's just getting started in the profession there's no better way to get an education than to kind of be thrown into the mix and say hey you got to you got to pick up the slack here and do this and do that and do this so that the program can function the way that it needs to and from your point of view you gained experience that I'm sure as you went on to your next opportunity at Central Florida, became invaluable to you because you had already seen a lot of the aspects of what it takes to be successful at the college level. And obviously you're jumping up from D2 to D1 when you go to Central Florida, but still you're seeing some of those things and how it had to work in order for the program to be successful. Talk a little bit about how the opportunity to get to Central Florida came about and then what your first year was like there as a GA. Yeah, so the opportunity came about. Uh, Bo Clark, uh, who is the coach of Flagler, he's the all-time leading scorer at UCF. Um, so he knew Donnie Jones really well. Um, his son, Bo Clark's son, J.P. Clark, was actually the ops at UCF. Uh, actually, before I, I came to be a GA, but uh, he was the ops guy. And then J.P. is now at the Clippers as skill development. But those two were the big relationships that I had to get in here. I, they hooked me up with coming to work camp uh, the summer before I got the GA spot. You know, I came and volunteered to work camp, didn't get paid. And they pretty much told me if I got into school, I could be a GA. So I, I studied for the GRE, which isn't fun. <laughs> it's tough. Uh, I got in, thankfully. And, uh, I became a GA and, and there was a big learning curve for me uh, trying to figure, you know, coming to a new school, not knowing anybody and trying to figure out, you know, wanting to get into coaching even more and coming off that last season, there was a big difference in uh, Flagler and UCF when I first got here, learning all the terminology. Uh, it was more NBA based and stuff I had never heard of in the plays and I didn't really feel comfortable, you know, at first. And then what happened was, is a coach named Sean Finney, uh, who was an assistant here, really took me under his wing and, and kind of taught me everything. Him and him and Brendan, sir. Um, you know, I think I think Coach Finney could really tell that, you know, I wanted to learn and I was always asking him questions. And my big, you know, I, that first year, you know, I was still trying to figure everything out. I knew I wanted to coach. I, I really loved the game. But it wasn't it wasn't really, to be honest, it wasn't until almost the end of the first year uh, where Coach Finney called me in his office and was like, hey, you know, I, I really believe in you. I think, you know, you could be a good coach. But he's like, man, you just got to – if you want to coach, man, you got to live this. And I think that's a talk that – a lot of a lot of managers and GAs need, and it's not that I wasn't working hard, but you know he was he was trying to say to me that you know he thought I had all the good stuff to become a coach, but you know I gotta I gotta really put the time in and and kind of 
you know, just just really just put that work in and 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 do everything and and try to be like a really learn the system of what we were doing. So from that point on, he when he talked to me, it just really motivated me because he believed in me and and told told me that he believed in me. So uh, you know, I I kind of became his right hand man that last year, my my second year as a GA, and you know I. I implemented some ideals and, and we actually did them, you know, uh, to try to make things easier with video. Um, you know, I mastered how to do our video that we use here. We use EXOs. Um, and that all, that all helped me, you know, especially to get the job that I have now was that last year. I, I really pushed it in, man. I was getting in the office. Oh man, like six fifteen every morning, I even, you know, I would, would work all day. And then my grad class would be at, I want to say, 5 or 6. I wouldn't get home until about 8.30 every night. And um, it was it was long hours, but I wouldn't trade it because the, the relationships I built with, with the coaches and was unbelievable. You know, Coach Coach Finney, you know, had me and my, me and my wife over for, uh, you know, for parties and, like, holiday parties and stuff like that. So I, I developed great relationships with them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it definitely was a jump, you know, coming from the D2 level, you know, to becoming a GA just cause the terminology and the, the travel's different. You're flying everywhere. And it's, it's definitely, a, it was a cool step, but obviously you really, my advice for anybody that does that jump is, you know, to try to, try to, you know, ask the assistants a lot of questions and, and learn and, and try to find a mentor, you know, and, and somebody that'll help you. I, I think that was the biggest key for me, for sure. Yeah, I think that feedback loop where you're talking to somebody and, hey, you know, how am I, how am I doing? You know, what can, I, what can I do better? What am I doing well? I think that's an important piece that a mm-hmm. lot of times – and I think this goes to any profession. You kind of get caught up in day to day and what you're trying to do. And you sometimes forget to solicit that feedback. And it goes to what you said earlier about being a lifelong learner. You know, the only way you can learn is by getting feedback from people who have done what you've done or who are, you know, one step up that ladder from where you are. And when you seek out those people, as you mentioned, then you're able to take the knowledge that they're there to impart to you. And then you can apply that into your own situation. And I, I, I always find it interesting when we talk about, you know, especially on the college level, when you're breaking into college coaching, you know, everybody sees, you know, the glamorous guys who are at the top in the NCAA tournament and they're making millions of dollars. And then you hear a story like the one that you're telling about, you know, starting out as a D2 assistant and then becoming a graduate assistant and you're, you're making very, very little money and you're in the office at six o'clock and you're not leaving until 8.30 at night. And I don't think people realize some of the challenges that it takes, especially when you're young and you're a young coach on trying to break in. So if you think about those first couple of years and even where you are now, how do you go about, because I know this is one of the challenges that's out there for coaches today. How do you strike the balance between your life outside of basketball? So obviously you're married, um, don't have kids yet, but at some point, you know, you may end up having some kids. Uh, how do you strike the balance between the passion that you have for coaching basketball and obviously the love you have for your wife, your family? How, how do you, how, what advice would you give for young coaches in that area? Yeah, I think that's, that's really the biggest thing. And that, to me, that's, that's one of the biggest separating key for coaches that they kind of break their way into this business is, you know, you got to find a, a balance between that. Um, I think the biggest thing that kind of separated me is, and for others, is you have to find a significant other that is cool with what you do. And what I mean by that, they got to be cool with the hours that you work. Right. Uh, you know, they have to be very supportive because you're going to spend a lot of time away from them. Um, I think that was the biggest thing for me is my wife always was so supportive of me uh, spending all that time in the office. She never, she never made me feel guilty about what I was doing. And and she knew that, you know, I had a bigger why of what I was doing. Um, so I think that's, that's really key is, you know, you're obviously as a young coach, you're in that stage, you know, a lot of coaches where 
you know, you're on the stage, you get married or finding somebody. So, you know, that's a big advice for me. If, if you really want to coach, uh, you got to find somebody that's really going to support everything that you do. Um, I, I think that's, that's one of the biggest keys right there. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you make a good choice right out of the gate. It makes things a lot easier going yeah. forward, right? <laughs> yeah, no question. She'll be happy I mentioned her. That's it. Too, so. Exactly. Exactly. Well, when you force her to listen to it, you know, before, it, you know, when it comes out, then, you know, she'll, she'll at least, she'll at least get a plug in there at some point. <laughs> no question. <laughs> All right. So talk a little bit about your role right now, what you're doing at Central Florida. What exactly is your day-to-day -day responsibilities and talk about what it's like working for Coach Dawkins and just kind of give us the rundown of, of how things are, are are running for you right now at Central Florida. Yeah, so things are great. I mean, I, I really, really love where I'm at. And like any job, you know, what makes makes a job really good is the person that you work for. And Coach Dawkins is incredible. Uh, Coach was at my wedding a couple months ago. The whole staff was at my wedding. Um, you know, he's so supportive. Uh, and I think that what – is what makes that the job fun, and I think um, I think with him, uh, he's one of the coaches. And like I, I've been saying, I'm the youngest guy on the staff, but you know he lets me have a voice. I'm in all the meetings, and you know he lets me kind of say whatever I want to say, which means a lot to a young guy like me, you know, who's thinking why why are these guys who've been coaching for 30 years listening to me, but. <laughs> It's the culture that we have is is, and that's the way coach learned from Coach K is a, a great ideal can come from anybody whether it's a manager, you know whoever it is uh, can come from anybody. So that that kind of shows you a little bit of our culture uh, here at UCF. But on a daily basis, you know right now we're in the middle of practicing. You know we just started up, so um, a lot of video stuff. You know we're in the film room like today. Today we scrimmage in practice and we sat as a staff after practice and clipped it up. Uh, you know, we'll show to the guys uh, tomorrow. Um, just stuff like that. You know, preparing for the season, you know, October is a big month of practice. I think you get, I want to say 30, 30 practices in 42 days, I believe, or something, something like that. Um, but yeah, this, this is the big preparation time before we get going. So how much film do the players watch? Let's say in the preseason, how much film of practice do they watch? And then when you guys are preparing them for a game, obviously the coaches are spending a lot of time watching film and, and, and breaking it down. But how much of that film work do you share with the players in prep for a game? So first, at this point in the preseason when you're practicing, just, you know, it's – it's all inner squad and you're just looking at practice tape, how much do the, do the players watch? And then in prepping for a game, how much tape do you share with the players to help them to understand what the scouting report looks like and what your guys' game plan is? Yeah, I think, I think it changes for your personnel. Like some, some teams have guys that, you know, really, really love watching film. You know, you got guys that really learn visually and, you know, some some teams maybe have guys that it doesn't really translate to, and you gotta, or they learn better when you bring them one on one. But as a, as a team, we we watch a lot of film. You know, we watch practice clips almost every day. Uh, we have guys that you know love film, and they actually learn from film. That they're able to take what they see and apply it on the floor. Um, practice clip wise, you know, we'll pick out a couple. You know, every day we'll probably show like ten. 10 different clips. Uh, if it's a scrimmage in practice, we'll show a bunch and a lot of teaching. Um, for, for scouting purposes, you know, uh, you know, usually I think it's three days before the game, you know, we'll start watching film of another opponent, um, you know, personnel, offense, you know, and that's man and zone. Based on out of bounds, you start watching that kind of stuff, the defense. Um, you know, you don't want to overshow too much where the kids, you know, they're overthinking the stuff, uh, you know, because once you tip off the ball, you know, it's – You got to play. You know, <laughs> you want to – yeah, you want to play to your standard. And, you know, obviously you want to know those key things about some of the personnel and maybe see a play coming or something. You know, you can't, you can't teach the kids every play that you scout. So 
um, you know, you can teach how to guard actions and stuff like that or guard certain type of screens, but you don't want to over, you know, pile their brains with stuff. So we don't, we don't try to show them too much scouting stuff. I would say our final edit with everything on it's probably between 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you know, we even shave that down, you know, even more. So, um, but you know, as a staff, uh, we watch a ton of film. Like when I, when I'm scouting a team, I'll watch their last 10 games usually. Um, you know, even if it has to date back to last year, um, I, I watch a lot of film and, and coach Dawkins is very unique. He's kind of like, and he learned this from coach K is, you know, if we win by one or lose by one or win by 30 and lose by however so much, we're going to come up to the office after the game and we're going to watch the game back over literally right after. So <laughs> we do that every game. So we'll break it down right after all the emotions are still there. And, you know, we're up here in the, in the film room, up in the conference room, trying to, you know, break down how we're going to, you know, get better the next day in practice or what clips we're going to show or how we're going to play the next opponent. Or we do that. And, you know, some nights, some nights we play at seven game ends at nine 30. We're in here to like 3 a.m. So, um, coach, coach loves film. I mean, we, when I say we watch a ton of film, I mean, I, it's, it's a lot. Coach, coach <laughs> watches every practice over every day. Uh, not many coaches do that. He'll, he'll watch every single practice back over. <laughs> so he's very attention to detail oriented. I mean, he loves that. He, he loves film and he got that from coach K coach K is the same way. Yeah. I think the value in the film is off the charts. And obviously today compared to how it might've been in years past, it would, you know, the, the way that we can access the video uh, compared to how we could do that in the past makes it so much more efficient to be able to pull out certain actions and, you know, defensive possessions and the different things that you want to look for. So as you guys describe sort of the, for lack of a better term, the assembly line of how the film gets processed so that it's ready.